Hello, welcome to my program. My name is Atoma Eji. We're on the second season, the 24th episode of Image Bearers. I'm so excited to have on the program Dr. Doug Massey. Uh, Dr. Doug Massey is the Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at Princeton University. Uh, he's written a number of books. Uh, I'm so excited today to have, on, to have him on. One of the things we're gonna just talk about is the inequality in society and really some solutions to that. And so uh, let's go ahead and uh, dive right in. Uh, again, thanks for coming on the program, Mr. Massey. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. Yeah. So the first question is, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're so passionate really about the uh, social inequality we see in society? Well, um, I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s. I was born in 1952. So I saw the early civil rights movement unfold and I saw a lot of the inequalities in American society firsthand in my childhood and teenage years. Uh, I grew up in Olympia, Washington, which had uh, no black people to speak of uh, and uh, very few non-white people to speak of. Um, there was one black person in town who was a blind guy who lived in a hotel downtown and he tuned all the pianos in town. Uh, and the first black family to move into Olympia, Washington and was when I was in junior high or high school and they moved down from Tacoma, Washington and he worked for the state, uh, state government, Olympia is the state capital. Um, so I kind of grew up in a, in a cocoon and in my senior year of high school, uh, our senior, our, our um, civics teacher had us read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I knew about um, racial strife because I'd been watching television and seeing what happened at the Edmund Pettus Bridge and the dogs and the fire hoses. And uh, I thought, oh, these things are just happening in the bad South and it's bad Southern people, racists in the South that's doing it when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, he grew up outside the South and the North. And you could see that race was uh, a, a dimension of inequality that was expressed not just in the Jim Crow South, but uh, throughout the United States. And I began to appreciate more the systems of stratification that had been erected in the United States that uh, limited opportunities for people of color and for people uh, who were poor and uh, for immigrants. And I saw the immigrant uh, issue play out in my own family because my mother, <coughs> excuse me, my mother is the daughter of immigrants. So my grandparents on my mother's side came from, were immigrants from Finland and they came to the United States just before the, uh, just after the second, the first world war. And um, they, uh, we're working in mines, in um, the mines, in, copper mines in Butte, Montana. My grandfather worked in the mines and my grandmother uh, worked in the commissary that fed the miners. Um, they didn't know each other till they got to Butte and they married there. And uh, my grandfather had a grade school education. My grandmother had a grade school education, not even a complete primary education. And um, uh, my mother was born in Alaska. Uh, the, my grandfather got caught in a mine fire in Butte and it wrecked his lungs. And eventually the family moved up to uh, Cordova, Alaska, where uh, Kennecott Copper had opened up a new mine and he got a job managing the railroad crew that managed the, kept the tracks running and cleared. Uh, between the mine, which is about 25 or 30 miles inland, and the port, on, which is uh, in Prince William Sound in Cordova, Alaska. My mother was born there. And my grandfather died when my mom was 16, so I never met him. I met my step-grandfather, who was also from Finland, and who um, grew up as a fisherman on the Gulf of Alaska. It's a hard life. And um, so my mother was born in Cordova, Alaska, uh, which had maybe 2,000 people. She graduated valedictorian in a class of like 14 people and um, worked for a year in a salmon canning factory. And then in the middle of the Second World War, 
took the ferry down to Seattle, Washington, where she entered the University of Washington, worked her way through college four years. And that's where she met my father. And my father uh, was the son of two college graduates. My grandmother graduated from Whitman College in 1919. And if you look at the statistics, the number of women who graduated from college in 1919 was a tiny fraction of all women. And my grandfather graduated from the University of Idaho. And my grandmother had grown up um, the daughter of a wealthy businessman in Spokane, Washington, who ran a sash and lumber company. And she had a privileged life. And she was um, a racist and she had lots of class prejudices and she was anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant. And so when my father came home with my mother, she was not happy. He was not, not up to the Massey family standards. This was an immigrant kid, daughter of immigrants, born in, born in the territory of Alaska, not even in the United States. And um, my grandparents uh, uh, on my mother's side were not even high school graduates, much less college graduates. So my grandmother always looked down on my, my mother and she tried to prevent their relationship from going anywhere by confiscating my dad's uh, fraternity pin, locking it in the safe deposit box so he couldn't pin my mother. This was the 40s, of course. And um, of course, here I am and it didn't work. Uh, but um, she always looked down on my mother and my mother um, had to struggle to be recognized and accepted in, in, by my grandmother and the Massey family. And um, I saw how my mother worked and how she um, got herself ahead. She believed in hard work and education. And I think she instilled that in me. Let me get rid of my email here. And um, so uh, I saw this play out in my own family. My mother, my grandmother used derogatory terms for black people, used the N word. Um, and what, as I grew older, uh, this, it was the sixties then in my teen years. Uh, and I read autobiography of Malcolm X and I got caught up in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. And, uh, I argued a lot with my grandmother <laughs> and, um, and uh, spent a long time arguing with her about all kinds of things. So that was kind of my formation as a young person growing up in the 50s and 60s and seeing the world one way, growing up seeing it as a fair place and then coming to understand that it's not a fair place and that a lot of the axes of, uh, of uh, disadvantage flow along the lines of color and class and immigrant status. And so I've, on my professional career, I've studied class stratification, I've studied racial stratification, and I've studied immigration and um, the unequal treatment of people of immigrant origin. Thank you, wow, that's, that's amazing. I think in some ways you could thank your grandmother for sharpening your skills and your arguments to help mold you into what you are, not that she intended it that way, so I think that's that's great. I do have a question. So I know you wrote a book. Um, I, I think you have it with you, the uh, Climbing Mount Laurel. Yeah. Um, can you hold that up real quick so people can see? Okay. So can you please tell us uh, why you wrote that book and uh, really what's been the impact of the people that have moved into that community? Well, it's a long story. Um, uh, I went to public schools all my life in Olympia, Washington, and then I went to Western Washington University to get my undergraduate training. And then in 1975, I went to Princeton University for graduate school and finished my PhD in 1978, and then did a postdoc at Princeton from 78 to 79 before moving on. And um, uh, while I was at Princeton, I learned about uh, something called the Mount Laurel um, case, which uh, there's a dog outside. <laughs> um, Mount Laurel case, which was a um, a, land, a lawsuit that was going on at the time. I was a graduate student in New Jersey, 
and the lawsuit was filed uh, by a woman named um, Ethel Lawrence um, with help from uh, a community action grant from the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, she grew up in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, uh, where she was born and raised. It was an old uh, Quaker town, a farm town, uh, on the Jersey side of the river from Philadelphia. And in the 60s, 50s and 60s, that area was becoming suburbanized. And Mount Laurel was changing from a, a farm town into a more affluent bedroom suburb of, of Philadelphia. And so she um, took advantage of the Great Society program and got a community action grant and received funding to build 40 units of affordable housing in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, so that people like her, uh, black residents of Mount Laurel, New Jersey, uh, who grew up there, could stay in their hometown and not be priced out. And she um, drew up a uh, plans and then went to the zoning board for approval and they turned her down. They wouldn't allow the affordable housing to be built. Uh, and uh, and uh, at a public hearing, they said, well, if you can't afford to leave, live here, then you'll just have to leave. And um, she took great umbrage at this and um, joined with some civil rights attorneys and filed suit in state court in New Jersey um, because uh, the zoning board alleged that they did not approve multi-unit housing, when in fact they'd already approved a luxury development of, 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 of multi-unit housing uh, in the same community. And so she alleged that it was a discrimination on the basis of race and class. And she filed this lawsuit in 1969, and the Fair Housing Act had just passed in 1968, giving her some recourse to do it. And New Jersey had a much older fair housing, affordable housing statute on its books, and it had a constitution that was very favorable towards civil rights. So she took it to state court, and uh, it went through court. Uh, and finally, in 1985, the uh, Supreme Court made a judgment that established what in New Jersey is called the Mount Laurel Doctrine. The court held that under the New Jersey Constitution, uh, you cannot write zoning regulations so that they preclude the construction of affordable housing. And moreover, that in New Jersey, every community has an affirmative obligation to allow for the construction of its fair share need for the for affordable housing. So every community had an obligation to allow for some share of affordable housing for the region. Uh, needless to say, this was not a popular decision with white suburbanites and it was fought tooth and nail, but that, that is the doctrine that prevails in New Jersey. And um, Ethel Lawrence unfortunately died before the project that she envisioned could be built. And for a variety of reasons, it was stalled uh, for, uh, before the local planning commission and the local politicians in Mount Laurel. And the developers had to ar arrange funding. And uh, it, the, the project that uh, she envisioned expanded from 40 units to 140 units and opened in 2000. And they named it the Ethel Lawrence Homes. And, um, uh, in 2003, I came back to Princeton, not as a graduate student, but as a, a professor. And I heard about the, the Mount Laurel, the Mount Laurel followed up on the Mount Laurel Doctrine that I'd heard about as a graduate student and um, heard about uh, the Ethel Lawrence Homes opening up. And so I wrote a grant proposal to do an evaluation of the Mount Laurel Project to understand first what happened to the community uh, what was what was the history of the community and how did uh, it come about that um, the Mount Laurel Doctrine happened and how did uh, the project get built? Uh, and then the consequences for the community of having 140 units of totally affordable housing occupied by about half black and half Latino poor families, 
how did that affect the surrounding neighborhoods in the city, in the town of Mount Laurel? And then more importantly, I wanted to study uh, how it affected the lives of the people. They got to move into this uh, project, the uh, Ethel Lawrence Homes, how it affected the families and, and their children to be able to move out of usually pretty bad neighborhoods, very disadvantaged neighborhoods into a white affluent um, job rich suburb uh, and what the experience was like for them and what it did in their lives. And so the grant um, didn't get funded right away, but uh, finally was picked up and funded by the MacArthur Foundation. And uh, I launched uh, the study with help from a couple of graduate students and a postdoc uh, and a collaborator who was uh, uh, an urban planner who had been around since the original Mount Laurel um, uh, uh, court cases had been decided and in some of the work for the early court cases. And we did the project, did the evaluation, we surveyed all the people who lived in the Mount Laurel project, who had ever lived in the Mount Laurel project in Ethel Lawrence homes. And then we, so we interviewed them. Uh, I had one of my graduate students uh, was actually at the University of Chicago at the time, but studying with me, uh, he was from Mount Laurel and he did ethnographic work, uh, in-depth in interviews and site visits and things all over Mount Laurel. And he knew the territory because he grew up there. And, and then we did a systematic analysis, a quantitative using quantitative survey data analysis of what happened in the lives of, of the people that moved in and how it affected their trajectories. And we did what's called a quasi-experimental analysis. So uh, an experiment, you randomly assign people to different groups and you look and see what the treatment effects are. So in, in, a, in a dictatorial world, I could randomly assign poor people to uh, the Ethel Lawrence homes and to bad neighborhoods and to observe differences over time, but you can't do that in the real world, of course. Uh, so we did a quasi-experiment where we were fortunate we had a good comparison group because the Ethel Lawrence homes uh, had a first come first serve policy. They advertised the availability of these new homes and people had to apply in person and they were on a list. And so there was a list of people uh, who had applied to get into the homes with all the information, the background information about the people themselves. And so we could compare the people who got into the homes with the people who wanted to get into the homes who hadn't yet got into the homes, all of whom had self-selected into the population of people who wanted to move into affordable housing project in a, in a white affluent suburb. So there's no difference in self-selection. So it's a quasi-experimental design. And we're able to show uh, pretty convincingly, I think, that, that the, uh, that the opening of the uh, Ethel Lawrence Homes in Mount Laurel, New Jersey uh, didn't uh, fulfill any of the negative prophecies that the local residents had been afraid of. So, uh, so, so just to cut in, and I've heard of this, this uh, term white flight. So the issue of when certain minorities, uh, blacks and others come into a community, then there's like this, it's, things are gonna get worse. So people are like just leaving. So you were able to prove that wasn't the case in terms of like things getting worse in this community, correct? Right, um, and um, white flight uh, was really a product of the period, well, it started in the 1920s and ran through about 1970. And it was driven a lot by um, black migration from the South, uh, looking people coming up to the North to looking for better opportunities and jobs and um, crowding into, um, black neighborhoods because there was a hard color line and the density would increase and increase and increase and then spill over and the neighborhoods would turn over. This was all organized by the real estate industry. Uh, and then the federal government was uh, involved because it uh, authorized it and demanded redlining for FHA mortgages and um, refused to grant FHA mortgages to black people. So it was almost guaranteed that if a neighborhood turned over it was going to go downhill. It was going to go all black really quickly. And then it was going to be cut off from investment capital by redlining and nobody in the community could get an FHA loan or really even a private loan from a bank. 
except on very exploitive terms. And so decline was pretty much built into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That started to come to an end with the civil rights era in 68, the Fair Housing Act in 1974, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And finally, in 1977, when I was a graduate student at Princeton, in 1977, they passed, uh, Congress passed and, and, uh, and uh, Jimmy Carter signed the Community Reinvestment Act which outlaw, outlawed redlining for the first time, which is discrimination against black neighborhoods. And so it's a different playing field. And, and the big driver, the mass immigration from the South was over. So there wasn't the pressures for, um, for neighborhood turnover like and white flight that there, there had been in the 50s and 60s, especially in the post-war period. But the prejudices were still intact. And the perception was that everything would go to hell in a handbasket if you let black and brown people into your community. And there was a huge public outcry when um, the, the Supreme Court said that Mount Laurel had to allow this a project to go forward and build 140 units to be filled by 90% by black and brown people. Uh, and there was public hearings, there was letters to the local editor of the paper, uh, there were demonstrations, uh, 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 very divisive city council meetings, hearings before the zoning, but the zoning commission in the city had no choice uh, and had to finally approve it. And people were sure that this was going to cause a decline in property values, a rise in crime rates, and um, and uh, increase in taxes. Uh, and we showed by direct comparison between um, Mount Laurel and surrounding suburbs that didn't get the a treatment of 140 uh, units of fully affordable housing, that uh, there was no effect whatsoever on hot property values, on crime rates, or tax burdens. That Mount Laurel looked pretty much like all the other communities nearby. And so that uh, Mount Laurel was able to accommodate uh, the opening of this project with, without paying any of the negative externalities that they had so, so feared. And uh, 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 then we showed that uh, uh, for the people who got to move into the Mount Laurel development, the Ethel Lawrence homes, um, it provided a huge boost in their life chances and launched them on a path of upward mobility. They were moving out of neighborhoods in Camden, which is only a few miles away from Mount Laurel and is I think the poorest city in the state of New Jersey. Camden's an old manufacturing city. It used to be the headquarters of where they made the color TVs for RCA and it was the headquarters for Campbell's Soup and shipbuilding and Sun Oil. It was a, a vibrant working class community, manufacturing community. And then of course the factories died in the 50s and 60s and 70s and it became very poor and, and, and overwhelmingly minority, Puerto Rican and black. Uh, and a lot of those people were the ones who were applying to come into uh, uh, Mount Laurel for opportunity. And a lot of them came down from Trenton, which is also a very poor city. It's the state capital, uh, but it was once a thriving industrial center with uh, steel, man steel manufacturing uh, plants, uh, uh, cable factories, uh, porcelain factories. In fact, the, the bridge going from Pennsylvania into New Jersey from in, into Trenton says Trenton makes and the world takes, which is now ironic because it doesn't make much anymore. Uh, it, it's basically, it's, it's only industry at this point is really the state government and most of the state workers don't live in Trenton. So they were moving, these were the people that were moving in. So they were coming from bad school districts, really disadvantaged school districts, uh, high disadvantaged neighborhoods with a lot of crime and disorder and violence. Uh, and very few jobs and opportunities. And they moved into this all white suburb. And, you know, there was a chance that they might feel completely excluded. And some of them did report trouble. Um, they reported a feeling of being always observed and watched because they were black and they had to make a point not to wear their sweat clothes into the 7-Eleven like everybody else. They had to put on nice clothes and still if they went into fancy stores, they would be followed around. Uh, so they did report those problems, uh, uh, but they were universally willing to accept those as costs of advancing their lives. And they put it behind them. 
And um, we discovered that compared to the comparison group of people who were waiting to get into the, um, uh, the project, that they uh, increased their rate of employment, decreased their rate of welfare usage, uh, increased the income, uh, especially the income from work, uh, uh, had uh, uh, much lower levels of exposure to disorder and violence in the surrounding neighborhood, because it's a big difference. It's a night and day between Camden and Mount Laurel in terms of crime and safety. And the numbers that I have, I have that uh, decrease of 67% in welfare, uh, earnings went up by 25%, mental health improved by 25%. This is re stress reduction due to safer neighborhood. Yep. The rates of employment rose 22%. The total average income was significantly, significantly higher uh, for, the, for the residents at 26,271 versus non-residents, 21,000. And twenty-two dollars. So that's significant. Yeah, it was a big boost in their life chances. Uh, Including and the kids' GPAs too, because they're able to be less stressful, do better at school, these kinds of things. Yeah, well, what you just reported were were what the adults in the household happened to them, and what happened to the kids was they got to go to a much better school district with much more, many more resources, and much better um, programs, and they were able to earn high grades that they would have gotten in a poorly performing school district, um, even though they were in one of the, the state's best school districts. So they ended up getting a much better education and that launched their children on an upward path of mobility. And so it was really a, a triple win for everyone. It was a win for people in the state of New Jersey because um, you took a group of poor people who had been um, welfare dependent and tax burdens and turn them into working taxpayers. Uh, uh, it was a it was a it was a boon for the town of uh, Mount Laurel because they're able to diversify their population and pay none of the external uh, negative extra externalities that they were afraid of. None of the terrible things that were prophesied happened. So it was seamless, and of course it was a huge benefit for the. The, the people who got to upgrade their living conditions and upgrade their neighborhood conditions and be launched on a path of, of upward mobility and self-sufficiency. Uh, and so since it was a triple win for everybody, when Chris Christie ran for governor um, about 10 years ago now, he um, campaigned against Mount Laurel on behalf of white suburbia and said he was going to end it. Uh, and he tried to over the first eight, six of his eight years in office. And um, he tried to pack the Supreme Court. He tried to stall the Supreme Court. He froze the money in the fund that was created to, to pay for Mount Laurel developments around the state. And it wasn't until the last couple of years of his administration, the Supreme Court got mad and ordered him to release the funds and, and start the Mount Laurel process over again. And so uh, that was about three years ago, uh, we have a new governor now who's a Democrat, uh, who's uh, pro Mount Laurel and it's been moving forward. And so Mount Laurel construction has resumed and uh, municipalities all over the state of New Jersey are now negotiating with the Coalition on Affordable Housing, uh, the state basically, to uh, figure out what their obligations under Mount Laurel are and how many units of affordable housing need to be constructed in each community all over the state of New Jersey. So um, uh, at the time we wrote the book, I think about 60,000 units of Mount Laurel housing had been constructed. And now it's expanding on that base to create much more. So basically what we, I wanted to, we wanted to write the book to use it as a, 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 a proof of concept that you can, you can have a fully affordable development that houses minority populations that doesn't cost anything to the surrounding communities and that can really improve things for all concerned, for taxpayers, for local residents, and for the poor people themselves who are able to launch their lives on a trajectory of upward mobility. And if you could follow this as an example of how to do a successful affordable housing development, then you could desegregate American society with respect to race and class and not 
produce any of the negative things that people so feared. So it was really a proof of concept and a, and a roadmap for how other people, other developers, other localities might proceed. Uh, and it's, it was it, the way that the project developed, it was they, they, were, they were aware of the terrible um, um, image that public housing had. You just say public housing and all kinds of terrible things pop into people's mind. Uh, and so when they built this house, they were they built these these Mount, these uh, Ethel Lawrence homes. They were determined not to use them as a symbol to stigmatize the residents. So they built townhouses that looked that felt fit in with the surrounding suburbs. They had a landscaping budget. They were on cul-de-sacs, um, uh, and uh, they uh, tried to match the architectural style of the surrounding neighborhoods. And so when the project opened, we did interviews in two adjacent neighborhoods. We discovered that about a third of the people we interviewed didn't even know there was an affordable housing project next door. And we discovered that um, of the people we uh, surveyed that really the people who were adamantly opposed were a small minority. And they raised such a ruckus that they made it seem like there was a terrible opposition against it, but it was really more of a vocal minority than a substantial majority. And uh, so I think that the book does provide uh, a way forward for people who read it. Uh, and it won, um, won an award from the uh, Association of uh, Public Planning Schools, uh, uh, Public Policy Schools, Urban Planning Schools uh, for, uh, for, for the best uh, product, uh, best book produced in whatever year. Uh, so, uh, and, um, we have four co-authors, neither of us were gonna get rich um, from royalties. So we assigned all the royalties over to Fair Share Housing, which was the developer of the Mount Laurel Homes. The Do you know how much has been raised through that by any chance? No, I should get a, I should get a statement from Princeton University Press. They published it, but I, I, we haven't seen a cent, so I haven't paid much attention, but I could find out. That's interesting. Okay, so just the last question is, um, I know, as you said, this is, I think, a roadmap for other communities uh, and so forth, and definitely other states, I believe. What other states have either uh, done something similar to Mount Laurel because of your book, or just in general have implemented something similar as far as the uh, fair housing? Well, one other state has, has set up a Mount Laurel kind of uh, uh, program uh, where they require new developments to have affordable set-asides. So when a new developer wants to build a home, uh, he goes to uh, gets permission from the local authorities in the state. Um, the developer has to commit to uh, some percentage, I think 10 or 15% of the units have to be affordable. And so developers all over the state, when they develop, um, are making affordable housing available. So it's kind of a deal where developers get to profit from market rate units in the construction of new housing uh, in return for which the state says that they need to make some available to affordable housing. Um, Montgomery County, Maryland, which is uh, the, an affluent suburb outside of Washington, DC, adjacent to Washington, DC, has a similar set aside program that seems to be working very well uh, uh, in addition. Um, actually, there aren't very many other states that have this sort of program. Connecticut? Uh, I'm working with people in Connecticut now who are preparing um, a legal action against a suburban community outside of New Haven uh, to uh, challenge their ban, their, their zoning uh, regulations that make it almost impossible to build affordable housing. And if that's successful, the um, people I'm working with hope to establish a Mount Laurel doctrine in Connecticut. That's great. Well, again, uh, thank you for your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> my and grandmother. Um, between my grandmother and my mother, I got a good education. <laughs> definitely, definitely. My mother believed strongly in education, and my grandmother did too. She went to college when most women didn't. Um, when I was growing up, if and my mother went, my, my mother went back to work when my youngest brother uh, went into school. And my grandmother was looked down on this. This was terrible. She, mothers shouldn't be working mothers. They should, they should look after their kids. Um, 
And then thereafter, every time one of us did something bad, it was because my mother had gone back to work and ignored her children. And every time we did something good, it was because, well, they're my grandchildren after all. That's so funny. Well, thanks again so much for your time. I think sure. uh, depending on your uh, schedule through the rest of this year or into next year, I'd love to see if I can maybe pick your brain again just on the number of books that you've written, kind of like your process and so forth. So we'll definitely have to uh, schedule a time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just finished um, a draft of a book that my co-authors are looking at right now. Um, um, it's called uh, Divergent Streams, uh, tentatively called Divergent Streams, The Diverse Origins of the New Black Elite, which um, is looking uh, we we look we use our data from surveys of black students attending 28 selective colleges and universities around the country and uh, we use this as a window to look upon this was these people went to college from 1999 to 2003 so that's the people that are currently moving into leadership positions and there's no better exemplar of the new diversity than Kamala Harris um, so we look at diversity with respect to racial origins multiracial origins, with respect to class, with respect to um, identity, uh, with respect to gender, with respect to um, uh, skin tone, and with respect to uh, uh, immigrant origins. Uh, and really she embodies all those things. She's the daughter of intermarried immigrants, one from India, one from Jamaica, who grew up in Berkeley, California. Uh, both of her parents held PhDs, so she's obviously upper class. Uh, she's got brown skin color, so she's kind of halfway between uh, whites and blacks. Uh, uh, but, uh, and uh, she um, went to uh, HBCU, and then she went to Berkeley, California for her law degree. So she's kind of an emblematic person in the new elite. Just coincidentally, we've been working on this book for three years and then as we're finishing it there she pops up as the vice presidential candidate <laughs> that's awesome some things sometimes things happen that way <laughs> yeah sometimes there's uh, it seems like there's fate involved yeah well again thanks so much for your time and again i really wanted to have you on the program again because i think there are a lot of issues in this world a lot of heartache but i think what you've done is really provided a solution or highlighted a solution should i say and provided a roadmap for others to follow as they try to also come up with solutions to a lot of the segregation and poverty and challenges that we face in our world. Well, that's one way forward, and there's no good reason to be opposed to it. If done right, it can benefit everyone. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, and uh, definitely thank your grandma and your mom at the same time, like I said, and definitely have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much for your time. Okay, we'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. Bye.